And with that, we are going to continue our conversation with one of the big draws of the day, Brad Garlinghouse. Uh, now, Brad is, as uh, many of our viewers know, the CEO of Ripple, and he is an alum of DC FinTech Week, uh, where he wowed the audience in 2019 and was very, very popular. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to uh, get his views on not only uh, our earlier conversation on CBDCs, but also uh, the evolving regulatory environment more generally uh, for, for cryptocurrencies and, and for blockchain uh, projects. Brad, thank you so much for coming back. Chris, uh, it is great to be here again. Uh, I, I'll, the two, two quick short comments. One is I'm amazed every year. You guys do such a great job. Uh, that last panel, I think, was indicative of the caliber of people and the caliber of conversation. So congrats. Uh, the second thing I think it's worth noting, uh, it is good to see you again. It's been a year. Uh, and in some ways, I think it's just interesting to think about how much has changed in that year. Uh, and in some ways, as I think we'll probably discuss in our discussion today, uh, it's amazing in some ways how little has changed. And, and I particularly think about some of the regulatory stuff here in the United States when I say that. But it's great to be back. Great to see you again. And uh, thanks for hosting me. Well, this is great. Well, you know, I think you're already kicking off um, a, a good sort of line of, of, of conversation. I mean, you know, a, a year ago, um, uh, when we were here in Washington, D.C., we were talking a little bit about Ripple's move to uh, our nation's capital. Um, and as you said, uh, there's certainly been a lot that has changed. And then there's there's obviously been a good deal uh, uh, that that uh, hasn't. Um, obviously, the coronavirus uh, has impacted everyone here uh, in the city and around the world. Um, but uh, besides sort of that particular exogenous event, I mean, what have you learned and seen about Washington, you're getting to the regulatory issues, that you may not have either learned or, or, or known or, or fully appreciated? And, and what has sort of struck you to be the most sort of memorable aspect of, of this last year? That's to get that last part again, it caught me thinking uh, the most memorable aspect. I, I might have to think on that for a, a minute, but you know, the, the thing I've probably learned, uh, I think Silicon Valley in general has had a, a deserved reputation of being kind of late and engaging in Washington. And I think in some ways, uh, the crypto community in Washington you know, hasn't been as active. And I think it, as we, Ripple, certainly have gotten more active, I've, I've definitely learned some things. And in some ways, I've learned that the U.S., from a regulatory point of view and from a legislative point of view, is very open to new technologies, is very open to how these technologies can be applied to benefit real people. Uh, you know, not just the, the trading, not just the speculation, but actually how do we apply these in a way that actually can benefit people? And certainly that's been true for Ripple. I've also, I suppose, you know, th to be fair, and maybe a little glass half empty, uh, the, the wheels of uh, legislative process and even regulatory process move quite slowly. And, you know, it's been two and a half years uh, since, you know, Bitcoin was declared not a security and Ether was declared not a security. And yet, other than you know some enforcement actions on the you know more I'll call abusive side, you know we still have a lack of clarity, and there's lots of examples of that we can talk about. Yeah, you, you know, just from a from a culture standpoint, you know, uh, when you well, certainly I guess we we haven't been traveling quite as much as as, as we used to. Uh, I mean, but but is there something um, that you see in terms of just just the the cultural makeup and backup? of the two cities that has been interesting when it comes to how one talks about, you know, cryptocurrencies, CBDCs, blockchain infrastructures, and, and the like. Um, I've always made the joke that, you know, when it comes to, to crypto, uh, Silicon Valley makes it, New York trades it, and DC regulates it, and they all have problems sort of uh, uh, talking to one another. I mean, you know, is there, is there something about it that, that you've seen um, uh, and it plays itself out um, either in the regulatory uh, process or, or in California uh, out when it comes to the market uh, sort of design process. Hey, look, I, I've been, you know, over the course of the last year, in the last couple of years, I, I've been kind of outspoken on some of these points. You know, I've been in Silicon Valley for 20 plus years, and I've been, you know, I think part of the fabric uh, of the, the, the evolution of the Internet. And you know, it's interesting to me sometimes that the, the Silicon Valley community sometimes I don't think fully appreciates uh, some of the things it could do better. You know, ex expressions like move fast and break stuff, uh, or you know, even Uber's approach at times, you know, I don't find that to be as constructive as it could be. And I think 
that has informed and that has created a culture at Ripple. Uh, you know, we have very specifically tried not to be quote disruptors, but rather, how do we be constructive? How do we work with the system? How do we work with regulators? And that has really paid dividends for us in many countries around the world. And I think that we have seen you know, an incredibly positive reaction, incredible, incredibly positive engagement from regulators around the world. Uh, but you know, as as we've already talked about, you know, in the U.S., you know, I think it was last week or the week before, the Department of Justice put out a you know a seventy-plus page paper about some dynamics in crypto, and you know, in the document, it references eight different groups within the U.S. government that have some sort of opinion about you know how crypto should be viewed, how crypto should be regulated, and it, you know, the, the challenge is for companies operating here in the United States it's really hard to know. You, you can't have regulations a guessing game. We, we at Ripple take it very seriously. We take KYC requirements, BSA requirements, AML requirements very seriously. But when regulation is a guessing game and you have different parts of the government saying different things, that makes it really hard to operate here in the United States. You know, we, we've I suppose, made some headlines over the course of the last week you know, about should we continue to be based, should Ripple, the company, continue to be based here in the United States? I was about to get into that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you know, it's it's it, look. I, I'm a U.S. citizen. I've, I grew up in Kansas. I am a you know, Ripple's a proud U.S. company for sure. But you know, we find ourselves in this situation where it's not a level playing field for what Ripple is doing in the XRP community is doing. It's really not a level playing field, and that that I have to you know think about that implication you know for the company. Okay, so 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 let's sort of think um, a little bit more more concretely about that, and sort of the, the international dimensions of um, you know whenever you're working in digital finance, digital finance is very often a cross border business, right? There you have people who either moving money from one country to the other. Um, sometimes talent can be distributed uh, across different kinds of locations, and and so business plans are inherently you know international. Something that we've already talked about at, at length earlier to, to today. Um, maybe uh, you could just sort of walk us through a little bit from your seat um, um, at, at, at the top of, of, of Ripple, what that looks like um, in, 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 in practice. I mean, you had made some very interesting remarks about uh, China. We talked about China with our earlier um, leaders panel from, from government. Um, and you had noted uh, not just the, the, the regulatory um, sort of uh, challenge in, in the United States in terms of there being a very sort of heterogeneous uh, sort of mixture of, of, of regulators, but, but you're also noting from a technology standpoint just how advanced some countries were becoming, especially uh, as it turns or as it relates to, to, to crypto. Um, what does that mean for a, uh, you know, a, a, a company like yours that's working really at the uh, sort of cutting edge of digital finance. I mean, what does it mean in terms of the friction um, and the choices um, that not just Ripple, but really any company that's that's dynamic has when trying to decide um, where to do business, how to do business, and you know what kind of cost uh, reward trade off is is in that mix, right? So I think, you know, like any investment, you think about how do I you know, maximize <clears throat> potential upside, but minimize risk. And I think that when you have certainty and you know how to invest, then that minimizes some level of risk. You know, your earlier panel was talking a lot about China. I love the book of Genesis reference. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, the way I think about the China dynamic, it's not that I disagreed with the panelists, it's that I think about it a little bit more broadly. It's not just about CBDCs. You know, when I think about this, China has been incredibly strategic. When they when they look at crypto and they look at blockchain, they've been very strategic. Premier Xi has actually come out and said, you know, blockchain investments is you know a critical priority, and you know I mean, they have made huge progress on the CBDC. You know, just airdropping you know, 10 million of their digital yuan to citizens in Shenzhen. It's like they are making real progress here. And I know that the previous panel, I think, fairly kind of says, well, look, it's not really about who's first; it's about how does it it, it mesh well. But we got to also remember, it's not just what China has been doing in the CBDC. Uh, you know, today we sometimes gloss over the fact that there is risk, and we, we talk about centralized and decentralized in these various technologies. Bitcoin mining is you know 65 to 75 percent 
controlled by Chinese miners. And I think it's hard not to argue that the Chinese Communist Party does not have the opportunity to have control there. You know, I'll take kind of a, uh, uh, I suppose, alarmist point of view. But what happens if Premier Xi loses a million dollars in Bitcoin? You don't think that the Chinese Communist Party has the opportunity to affect the, a change to the Bitcoin blockchain and make a re reverse Premier Xi's you know, million dollar loss of Bitcoin that might have been hacked? So I, I think you know, that's true for Bitcoin, that's true for ETH. That's of course leaving aside the, the, the massive energy dynamics and pollution dynamics that we see with Bitcoin and ETH. But it, it's concerning to me that we here in the United States have given those technologies an advantage and goes back to the certainty of the investment you're asking about. Just last week, I was talking, <clears throat> speaking with a developer here in San Francisco, and you know he was talking about investing and building upon ETH as a development platform. And one of the reasons he cited is, look, there's certainty and clarity about the regular regulation around ETH. So would I invest in or build upon a different stack when there's not certainty? You know, th that's a real issue. And I, I think you see governments like the UK, like Singapore, like Japan, the UAE, or even Switzerland. They, these are all really good examples where regulation has provided, a, the, the clarity of the regulation has provided the ability for a healthy market to develop and a holistic view. And it, that I think helps, you know, companies like Ripple, companies that, you know, want to yeah. invest in this space. You know, um, when you think about uh, the amount of development in, in in crypto, I think that a lot of people, um, when it comes to national competitiveness, will think, well, you know, one country, this is a, a new technology, so the barriers to entry are are low enough that perhaps it's you know countries can play uh, catch up. Um, yeah. you, you know, it, you know uh, better than. Than almost anyone, you know, what it takes to be a, um, you know, to be a cutting edge actor in, in in this space. You know, when you think about sort of the competition within, again, uh, not just CBDC, but really crypto and even blockchain uh, writ large and supporting softwares and, and and digital infrastructures. I mean, how accurate is that? Um, um, how easy or hard is it for an entrant to Play catch up and to and to be competitive, um, uh, and and it, what does that usually take? You know, I think it's a really important and good question. I think it kind of, as you know, came up in your earlier panel in the context of you know, is it important to be first or important to get it right? And where there are not network effects, where there are not kind of effects that are kind of the flywheel, then I totally agree that whether you're first, whether you're second, whether you're tenth. The ability to play catch up, I think, you know, no big deal. There are dynamics, though, that uh, kind of what I'll loosely call network effects, where the liquidity of an asset, right? So the fact that Bitcoin is the most liquid digital asset is a good thing. And once you have that, that's that's helpful to the Bitcoin community. Look, by the way, you know, as much as I get accused of being, you know, uh, anti-Bitcoin, I own Bitcoin. I'm, I'm bullish on Bitcoin for sure. So uh, I, I think that it's important to understand that those advantages that can start because of an uneven playing field, it's not just, oh, okay, now we're going to level the playing field and it's going to reset to normal. The longer those advantages are in place, the more the competitive dynamics and almost the, the, the moats are created. And I think that that's, that's hard to overcome. And I think that's where I think China is looking at a very long, not just you know, a decade out, but maybe a century out and making sure that, look, these underlying technologies really are going to be the underpinnings of the internet of value. And it's going to change the way transactions around cross-border money movement works, certainly where Ripple is focused, but it's going to change how other transactions work as well. And I think China is being very smart and very strategic by investing in this and by having a very significant stake in it. And you know, I think it's uh, it's going to make me a challenge just to you know, hey, the U.S. now has a little playing field uh, with these te other technologies, and I'm not even just talking about you know how that benefits the XRP community, you know, but others that are doing interesting things that are being responsible players and working with regulators. Uh, that I think you know, all we're asking for is that level playing field.
you know, it, it, it's really an interesting and 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 important uh, uh, conversation. I mean, you know, China is is um, uh, their, their approach is is not only uh, uh, domestic, but but they do have and have thought about how do you create sort of a, a, a digital infrastructure overseas. There's been a longstanding conversation about the internationalization of its currency, and it's interesting how those kinds of things intersect with how they build out uh, their their money. I mean, have you been struck by by uh, just how much in this last year since since we last uh, talked at FinTech Week? You know how much that CBDC conversation has has taken off, and 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 what do developments in those pockets of the ecosystem mean for for Ripple and for XRP? Well, I have been uh, impressed and frankly even surprised. You know, I have I, I commented publicly one of the, I was at uh, Davos, the World Economic Forum event this past February or January, I guess, in Davos. And I remember one of the first comments I got when I was there, I was walking down some stairs and a, a uh, regular from another country walked by. I was like, oh, you're nice to see you. And it, his comment to me was, you know, uh, crypto is still a bad word here. <laughs> I thought, that's interesting. I mean, it's a tough way to tough way to start the conference. But what's interesting is today, you know, what we have seen and the, the conversations Ripple is having with you know various central banks around the world is about seventy percent of central banks are really looking seriously at this technology, and you know, so I think that that is indicative of how that world is changing. Now, that being said, that definitely I think is a constructive thing for Ripple and for the XRP community. You know, just having a uh, central bank issued digital currency still does not solve the dynamic of needing to settle a transaction, settle a, a payment between the Argentinian peso and the Australian dollar. Uh, you know, having having really uh, simple transaction dynamics, both on the messaging and on the liquidity, is still critical to make that work to really enable the internet of value. You know, we we think about and we talk about so. I actually see it in some of the work we are doing with central banks uh, around the world. Uh, I think it's a very positive dynamic. And look, I, I think it's still unclear to me exactly how central bank issued digital currencies. Your, your last panel talked about this. You know, what, what problems are they solving? You know, is it uh, circumvention of some of the existing commercial banking infrastructure? Uh, you know, how do those dynamics play out? Look, I, I don't know. What I do know is, regardless of how that plays out. You still need a lot of. Uh, you need a neutral asset that doesn't carry that baggage as you know a central bank issued digital asset. And XRP as extremely efficient on the speed, extremely efficient on the cost per transaction, and the scalability is really well suited to to help solve that. Which is why Ripple has invested where we have. You know, tying that all that together, tying it together with your original question of like uh, uh, the competitiveness of the United States and sort of business and strategic decisions that, that you have to make ev every day. And then against the backdrop of what has changed dramatically since we last talked, uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I mean, what has or how has the coronavirus um, pandemic, or how has it impacted your business strategy, you know, as as the leader of, of, of Ripple and, and um, you know, what what are you looking at and what should we be looking at um, in the next 12 months uh, uh, from, from you? Yeah. So look, I, I think there's no doubt the pandemic has impacted you know, lots of parts of the economy and certainly it has impacted Ripple. And in some ways it's impacted us in a very, very positive way. And in some way it's made our jobs harder. You know, at the core, a big part of what Ripple does is, you know, we sell financial technology. We sell all that underlying kind of plumbing to financial institutions, banks, payment providers. And, you know, that is, certainly, you know, we've continued to sign up a lot of uh, new customers and still averaging kind of, you know, two, uh, yeah, about two a week, uh, which is great. But, you know, that is a little bit slower than we were at the beginning of the year in January. And, you know, that is a lot because if you can't show up to the bank of Chris and the bank of, you know, FinTech week or whatever we want to call it, you know, that makes the sales process a, a little higher friction. Now, on the other hand, the dynamics of the pandemic have highlighted some of the huge gaps in our financial infrastructure. Uh, you know, from moving from cash to digital, uh, and it, I think it highlights how some of the unbanked and underbanked have been left behind by what's happening globally. And so that coupled with, you know, massive inflation of fiat currencies, 
you know, that's really good for the, the, the crypto industry at large. You know, it's not at all a surprise to me to see that the broader crypto market overall, you know, according to, you know, the, the sources I think you and I both looked at, it's up you know, somewhere around 90% this year. Uh, and I, I, I'm pretty bullish about what the, the next year or two or three looks like for the crypto market at large. And that's largely because when you, you know, print as much fiat stimulus, fiat currencies as we're seeing globally, uh, that, that will lead to inflation. It does devalue those fiat currencies. And so uh, I think you, you know, obviously gold doing very well, you see crypto doing very well, and I think that'll continue to be the case. Uh, you know, uh, we only have a, a minute or two left, but I, I, I did want to, you know, when we were talking about the different cultures of the East Coast and the West Coast, um, and, and you're talking about financial inclusion, you know, w one of the things that I, I, I did notice, and um, I, I've, I've been, uh, r you know, which certainly has caught my eye, is that Ripple's been a little bit ahead of the game, particularly when it comes to conversations on uh, diversity, and, you know, actually called out pretty explicitly Ripple's intent to uh, diversify its board. Um, from people here on the East Coast, uh, maybe in Washington, D.C., and in, in, in New York, this sounds a lot like something that's not just sort of morally um, uh, justified, but but pretty good business. Um, but, but why, you know, has it been harder, you know, to have that conversation, you know, culture-wise in, in, in Silicon Valley? And, and, you know, just wrapping things up, I mean, wh what made you feel like this was the right call and worth making sense when you're sitting here navigating CBDCs and cross-border payments and competitiveness of the United States and 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 regulatory uh, issues and the like. You know, I, I, Chris, I'm glad you asked about this. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I've been out in this part of the world for 20 plus years. I've seen the the tech community kind of go through a, a number of different undulations and. The thing I feel very strong and kind of very deeply as I think about the Ripple culture is I, I think we have actually an obligation to lean in. I think we have an obligation to be a part of the solution for some of the macro problems we see. And, you know, I think that the saddest part of that for me is I see tech companies that I think have, if not, well, at, at, at best, they've exacerbated some of those problems. And so we have, I think, from you know, the, the origins of the company tried to lean into that. You know, one example I'll give real quickly, and I know we're running out of time here, is, you know, we did made a big announcement recently about going carbon neutral and uh, making sure the XRP ledger is carbon neutral. And, you know, at the same time we're making those announcements, I, I find it interesting that, you know, Square is out there exclusively supporting Bitcoin, which, you know, again, I, I think, let's remind ourselves, Bitcoin mining consumes 1% of global energy consumption. Wow. You know, how can a company, and I think I think all of us are corporate environments, I think Square should be thinking about what is the carbon footprint of that decision? Now, I happen to know that one of the reasons why Square looks at that that way is because there is regulatory certainty about Bitcoin. And as we look at other companies looking at this space, you know, they look at what is the regulatory certainty. And so it's ironic, in my opinion, the U.S. has made decisions which are actually exacerbating things like global warming by virtue of supporting you know, this heavily mining intensive stuff. Anyway, I know I'm a little bit off your core question. Suffice it to say, you know, Ripple has and will continue to invest in making sure we have diversity at all levels of the company. We've been really fortunate to have some fantastic women on the board. We did join the recent uh, pledge to add uh, a person of color to the board of directors, and we are working on that very actively right now and uh, hope to have an announcement soon. Well, well, congratulations, and thank you so, so very much for your time, Brad, um, both from last year and also showing up again this year. Uh, it's really interesting, and uh, as always, I learned a lot. Chris, thanks for having me again. Hope to see you again next year. Absolutely. My name is Marco Lelerba, and 